Okay. All right. Well, let's let's get started. So it's one o'clock. Our event has officially begun. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham, for joining us. Um, for those who are new um, to knowing about Community Alliance, we are a substance misuse prevention coalition. We are based in Hales Corners in Greendale, uh, and we serve both those communities, basically anybody who live, lives, works, learns, or plays there. And um, since COVID, obviously, we wanted to start providing information to community members um, uh, in virtual format. So this is our first Facebook Live, hopefully the first of a few. And um, as we get into our conversation and our Q&A with Dr. Cunningham, I just wanna invite anybody um, to go ahead and drop any questions or comments in the chat. I will be trying to monitor that. So if you see me looking to the side, that's what I'm trying to keep up with. Um, and this will be available on our Facebook page. And then in a few days, I'll have it up on our YouTube channel as well. And I'll share those links once they're available. Um, I'll turn it over. I want to introduce Dr. Cunningham. He is a professor with the Concordia School of Pharmacy. So Chris, if you want to just give your, give everybody an introduction and then we can dive into some of the questions. Yeah, sure. So thanks so much. I'm really appreciative of this opportunity to talk to the community, even if it is in a virtual setting like this. It's just so wonderful that we're able to uh, virtually connect, even if we can't physically. So, um, so thank you so much for uh, for facilitating this. And this is also my very first Facebook Live event as well. So, you know, here's hoping that everything goes smoothly. <laughs> Um, so a little bit about me. So, um, so as you mentioned, I am an associate professor of pharmaceutical sciences at Concordia University, Wisconsin School of Pharmacy. Um, I am originally from Maryland, the Washington DC area. Um, I earned my bachelor's degree in chemistry and Germanic studies from the University of Maryland and College Park. My PhD is in pharmaceutical sciences from the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy in Baltimore. And I was a postdoc at the University of Kansas School of Pharmacy in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, I've been here in Southeast Wisconsin at Concordia, which is in Mequon, uh, for about 10 years now, moved here in 2011. And I teach in our School of Pharmacy. So I teach our pharmacy students who will become pharmacists about how drugs work, how medications are developed, how they do good things in the body, but then also how they do bad things in the body. So um, this type of a lecture is right up my, or this type of a conversation is right up my alley. Um, and my research, my independent research is in uh, substances of abuse. So I study uh, opioids and cannabinoids um, and alcohol. And what we try to do is learn about what it is about these different drugs or medications that make them work and how they are uh, effective in the body and in the brain and how we can make new medications that can help patients or individuals who are dependent upon these things. So, um, so I'm very uh, interested in medications development. Wow, that is an impressive um, uh, academic and research uh, portfolio you have behind you. So this is fantastic. I'm so glad you were able to join us for this conversation. Um, so we'll, we'll dive into to some of the questions, some questions that have been sent um, before, before the live event. So, you know, when we're talking about marijuana, I feel like there's just so much information out there. Almost every day, I feel like I see some sort of headline about either legalization or new research that's come, that has come out. Um, and there is just as much of a spectrum of opinion when it comes to um, you know the the retail or medicinal use of marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, as a substance misuse prevention coalition, we are um, one of our goals is to reduce specifically youth use of marijuana. Um, just because we know that kind of no matter which way you slice the pie, it's it's not good for that developing. Um, that, that, that developing brain and that developing body. And we want to make sure that our teens grow up to be healthy and strong adults, obviously. Um, so with that being said, what are some of the top health concerns around marijuana, just for like the general population? Absolutely. So I guess first I'll give my overall blanket disclosure is that I am a professional in 
um, in chemistry of substance use and abuse disorders. Um, and I am not uh, paid by the federal government to say anything in particular. I do have a grant from the federal government that uh, supports some of my opioid research, um, but I am not being paid by anybody. You're not even paying me either. So, um, so everything that I'm saying is my own professional opinion and not the official opinion of any law enforcement or anything like this. Now, in terms of the top health concerns um, related to marijuana use, in particular to teens, uh, first is what you just said is the developing brain. We have lots of data that suggests that uh, cannabis use uh, in youth as a teenager, as a young adult, can affect the development of the brain. Um, marijuana and cannabis, I will use these terms interchangeably, so, uh, so hopefully that's not too confusing. But marijuana does affect the brain. It's into the brain and it's going to affect um, a lot of our motor coordination. It's going to affect our learning and memory. It will also affect our mood, uh, stress, anxiety, paranoia kind of effects can happen. Now, when we talk about the developing brain, obviously we're talking about the brain sort of making important connections uh, that are important for long-term uh, development um, in all of these different places. So as an example, uh, we do see evidence that there is approximately a loss of about eight IQ points between the ages of 13 and 38 for individuals who use marijuana long-term. Um, we're also seeing another big issue is uh, with smoking marijuana while pregnant. And so this is, a, this is an issue for, uh, for young females. The developing body with uh, the developing fetus inside, uh, inside the woman uh, is going to be particularly uh, susceptible to uh, long-term damage. And so this is something you absolutely do not want to do. Uh, absolutely no engaging with, um, with cannabis uh, while pregnant. So those are two um, pretty particularly harmful things. A third is dependence. Uh, oftentimes we think of this like addiction. When you take a substance and you feel really good on the substance, you want to keep taking it. And then you decide, you know, I don't want to take it anymore, but your body is saying, no, we need that thing. That's something that can also happen with cannabis or marijuana. A lot of times people think that this is something you can't get addicted to. That's not entirely true. There is um, a, a cannabis dependence syndrome uh, that can happen. I guess I would say the third huge thing, especially for young adults and teens, is drugged driving. Um, individuals who think they can smoke a little bit of pot and then go drive, you don't want to do that because marijuana affects your reflexes. And drugged driving is like drunk driving. You just don't want to do it because the chances of getting in an accident are, are pretty high. Well, you bring up two, two, two really good points that I want to circle back to and kind of dive into a little bit more. So um, the drug driving for sure, but then also the, the idea of addiction or dependence with marijuana, I feel like is kind of a, is something that's coming out in newer research that, you know, marijuana has obviously been around for a long time and everyone said, oh, you can't get addicted to it. It's, you know, it might be like habitual, but it's not necessarily a true like physiological addiction. Mm -hmm. um, does that have anything, does that newer research have anything to do with like the increasing potency that we're seeing in marijuana that's being um, developed or manufactured, farmed, whatever you want to say? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so in terms of uh, the strength or the potency of marijuana today, uh, if we were to compare the same uh, kind of cannabis plants or marijuana plants to um, maybe older generations, so those who grew up in the 1990s, 1980s, 1970s, 1960s, every decade it seems like the potency of, uh, the average potency of plant material keeps going up um, as we're seeing more individuals who want to get a stronger or a deeper um, high sensation they're kind of gravitating towards the more potent, um, more strong types of plants. So we're seeing definite increases in the content of a psychoactive chemical that's called THC. Mm -hmm. And THC stands for tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, now THC is one of many constituents of marijuana. There are over a hundred different uh, what we call cannabinoids that are present in the plant. 
Another key cannabinoid is called CBD. Uh, mm -hmm. Cannabidiol is something that we're seeing a lot of, and so I'm super glad to talk about that one too. But in terms of the addiction and dependence potential of cannabis and marijuana, THC, that active principle that causes individuals to feel that high sensation, to feel good, to feel calm, to maybe feel some rewarding effects, the more of that chemical that's in your product, the more that you're exposed to, the higher the feeling will be, but then also the higher the potential for long-term what we call substance use disorder or uh, cannabis use disorder, um, the, long, the higher that potential is. And so in terms of the addictive potential or the dependence potential of products, the more concentrated the product is, higher the experience, that's just the stronger it's going to be um, to, uh, that can be kind of, uh, uh, can take over, uh, can take over your brain. Wow, that's that's really good to know, especially considering I know that some of the 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 retail products that that I've seen at different presentations and stuff like that can have concentrations of upwards of, you know, eighty to ninety percent THC sometimes in these vape cartridges, and it's just it's just so so potent. It's incredible. Um, yeah. So the other so the other point that I thought was really interesting to circle back to, especially for teens, is that drug driving. So we know that. Yeah. Um, just learning how to drive for teens, uh, motor vehicle accidents are one of the highest causes of death for that, for that population. Um, and that's mainly, I mean, part of that's due to the fact that, you know, teens tend to be a very healthy population. We don't necessarily see, um, you know, uh, high rates of cancer, heart disease, and stuff like that that we see in older adults and just for the general population that, that kind of, those tend to top the list in terms of causes of death. But, you know, for teens, the, one, one of the huge safety concerns is adolescent, is um, uh, automobile safety. And so, you know, to hear you talking about drug driving and that impairing um, your motor skills, um, because marijuana interrupts our, you know, our ability to kind of physically move our body in a coordinated mm -hmm. fashion and operating a vehicle combined with being 16 in that adolescent brain and you know driving is a is a is a new motor skill for people and so where you and I can probably get in the car and like turn off our brain and just like end up at work and we don't really <laughs> consciously think about it yeah teens yeah. are obviously thinking about turning left turning right turn on my turn signal you know press on the brake yeah. oh somebody's slowing down in front of me I'm anticipating and stuff like that. Those are all very conscious decisions that need to be made when you're a new driver and then putting on top marijuana in the system on top of that. I can see how that is a is a really could be a really big concern for for teens and parents in the community. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, if you think, for example, about um, if you wait, if you just wake up and you're still kind of groggy and then someone's going to give you keys and get in your car, you don't want to do that either for exactly the same reason. Like you're you have to do like a bunch of different stuff at once. And when you're first learning a new skill, that's not the time that you want to be slowing down your cognitive process. Yeah. And I can even think about that for teens that are um, playing sports or mastering an instrument and, you know, really diving into that skill set. Marijuana is just going to mess with all of that. Right. Kind of exactly. ability to interact with that, that activity. Mm -hmm. Yep. And eye um, coordination. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Awesome. So I'm just checking out the questions here. Um, so another another big concern, especially with with teens, is this whole vaping thing. So um, could you kind of like tell us what exactly, you know, how can marijuana be vaped? I know where I think a lot of people are very familiar with um, with vaping nicotine and e-cigarettes and stuff like that, but can somebody put marijuana in one of these vaping products and, and use it to, to get high? Or how does that yeah. work? Yeah, that has been, um, I'm really glad that you brought that up because um, as recently as uh, 2019, uh, we saw a lot of toxicities and a lot of problems with uh, e-cartridges and, um, and THC and then some lung disease. So yeah. first a step back. So vaping. So vaping is going to be sort of like a way to inhale uh, a, a compound, inhale in this case a drug. Um, with smoking a cigarette, for example, you're taking a, a heat source like a lighter, 
you're physically lighting uh, paper, so um, so a paper kind of holder, such as a cigarette or uh, or something else. Like and a cigar wrapper. Yeah, yeah, cigar exactly. Okay. And it's the act of burning that paper that causes the stuff inside the tobacco or the marijuana plant material to also heat up and to aerosolize. And then you inhale, and you're essentially inhaling the smoke from the paper, but then also the, the, um, the aerosolized material from the plant. And so that's what happens with a cigarette. And with vaping, the idea is very similar. You're, in, you're putting a heat source onto the end of a, of a, um, a pipe or, or a, a, a cigarette, and you're aerosolizing product and you're inhaling that. Now, the big difference is that there is no paper product in there, so you're not going to be inhaling ash. And so the heat source at the end of a cigarette will heat up some sort of an oil, be it a tobacco, a nicotine oil or a cannabis oil, and will heat it up to the point where it becomes aerosolized. You inhale and it gets into your lungs. Now, a lot of people think that vaping is inherently more safe because you're not inhaling that ash. You're not inhaling the burnt paper product like you would with a normal cigarette. Um, but there's still some issues with vaping, in particular with vaping THC. And so when we think about individuals who are using the cartridges of oil, um, and sometimes I have a, a, a demonstration thing, but I don't today, uh, so we don't have any oil that I could show you. Um, but essentially what this oil would, would be is a very concentrated form of THC and maybe some other materials that come out of the plant. So limonene, maybe some CBD, and maybe some other cannabis. So this oil, you have an electric heating element at the end of the pen. You heat the oil really high, it aerosolizes and you inhale it into your lungs. And that's the way that you get the subjective, high, altered sense of consciousness effects like you would from smoking a marijuana cigarette. But there are some definite concerns. Uh, first of all is that that cannabis oil the THC oil is very concentrated with THC. So if you have more THC in your oil than you would in a marijuana cigarette, you're exposing yourself to more, just like we were talking about before. More THC exposure means stronger experience, but that means higher potential for long-term damage and dependence. But there's another issue that came out last year, well, I guess a year and a half ago now, with the vape pens is that we saw this extremely dangerous type of, um, type of serious inflammatory lung injury um, that's called e-cigarette vaping product use associated lung injury or e-valley. Long, long name just means uh, major problems to the lungs. And so we were seeing uh, thousands of individuals across the country in all 50 states be hospitalized. We saw 52 deaths, and this is numbers as of December of 2019. Um, through a mechanism that turned out to be related to uh, THC oil-based products that people were mm. putting into e-cigarette pens. And the particular danger there is that there was another additive that was added into the product called um, uh, vitamin E acetate. And this product gave the, uh, made it a little bit easier for the THC to aerosolize but the problem was is that this vitamin E acetate was also being aerosolized, getting into our lungs and disrupting the ability of our lungs to, um, to properly inflate and deep. And if you can think, you don't want to mess with your lungs if you're producing permanent lung damage, that can give you long-term uh, for the rest of your life consequences. So, um, wow. and, and so we're, we're really concerned about that uh, in that, you don't really know what's exactly in your vape cartridge that you are exposing yourself to. And that could be really toxic and dangerous. Yeah, that is that is a huge concern because it is, I mean, vapes themselves um, are a new product. You know, they weren't in the United States until like what, 2007 or so. So it's mm -hmm. a really new product. And I know that there's a ton of uh, recent developments with FDA and regulation and stuff like that that um, I encourage people to go and read up about. Um, um, but, you know, like you said, like you don't know 
you know, it's not like there's necessarily like a list of ingredients on those vape cartridges, um, yep. you know, coupled with the high concentration of THC that they're putting in, that they're able to condense into these oils effectively, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I definitely um, can can be the recipe for, for some serious health health outcomes, unfortunately. Absolutely, yes. Um, so, uh, so regulation kind of gets us, kind of gives us a nice segue into kind of talking about marijuana legalization and what that really means. And um, even, you know, as you and I were, were kind of planning out this session, there were headlines popping up, you know, that were just breaking the surface, you know, from uh, above COVID and everything else that's happening right now. Um, but right now, obviously we're in Wisconsin um, in Milwaukee County. Um, yep. but I know that we have some neighboring states that have recently legalized. Obviously we have other states in the country like Colorado and Washington that have been, that have had legal, um, recreational sales or retail sales of, of cannabis for quite some time. Um, what are those states that, that, that have had legalization, you know, what have they been experiencing or what have we learned from them so far? Sure, yeah, and um, you know, the best way for us to think about what might happen here is to look at what's happened in other places. So, uh, so Colorado and Washington State were two of the earliest states to um, completely decriminalize uh, possession and use of marijuana for both um, medicinal and recreational purposes. Uh, this is very similar to the type of le um, legislation that was passed and uh, enacted uh, just last year uh, in Illinois, just down the street. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when we look at Colorado and Washington State and try to ask if we can learn anything from them. Um, so first of all, I, I did do a little bit of research and I found uh, some articles, one of which is a New York Times article that just came out um, just last year. Well, 2019, I keep saying just last year, but I'm still in 2020 mindset. Um, but there was this great article that came out that kind of gave a retrospective on five years of um, the legalization in Colorado and Washington. And what did we sort of learn? Now, one of the first things that we learned was that it actually didn't seem like the use, um, like more people, more youths were using um, marijuana after cannabis was legalized. Now, uh, that basically means percentage of young adults who were using before legalization is about the same as using it after legalization. But kind of hidden in that data, it certainly seems that the individuals who are using cannabis are using stronger cannabis and they might be using it more. And so when we think about potential, um, like potential consequences of legalization and what young people need to be concerned about is, um, you know, staying away from it, staying away from something that you're not uh, certain what it is, not certain what it could do, because it can be very strong and it can um, potentially lead to long-term uh, consequences. Now, other things that we saw in uh, Colorado right after uh, legalization is going back to that drugged driving. Drug driving mm -hmm. rates went up. And so that is not only with youth and young people, but it's also with adults. So more individuals were smoking marijuana, more smoking marijuana meant more um, relaxed attitudes towards driving. So, um, so that was another consequence. And that's, and drug driving, you know, for adults too, that's, uh, I, at least as far as I've, I've heard so far, there is no like um, breathalyzer for marijuana yet. Like we do have for, for alcohol. So, it's probably really hard for us to tell, you know, the extent of drug driving when we can't like have, we don't have like a super concrete way to measure it. You know, if a police officer pulls somebody over suspected of, you know, being under the influence of marijuana, mm -hmm. you know, I think there, there, there are some, um, some field sobriety tests that can be done, but I don't know where the technology is right now for us to have like a definitive, like, yes, this person's intoxicated or, yeah, no, this person isn't intoxicated. Yeah, it's it is. You're exactly right. It's a little bit different because we don't have that blow into this thing, and we'll tell you exactly what your blood THC level is. We don't have that technology. Um, really, it's more of a subjective what the law enforcement officer 
fields, um, maybe gives you a field sobriety test um, and can also give you a breathalyzer just to rule out any uh, alcohol that could be intoxicating you. Um, but we do have the ability to um, uh, submit a, a person to a urine drug screen uh, after the fact that they've been taken into custody. They could also get um, I have a blood draw and that would tell you exactly how much is in your system. But it's kind of this also weird thing in that the levels of THC in your blood don't necessarily correlate with your level of intoxication. Some people get really intoxicated by a little amount of THC and vice versa. Some people can ingest a lot of THC and not show uh, overt signs of intoxication. So it's not as simple as you will have this much drug, it means you are this much intoxicated. So there's a lot of like gray area there. Gotcha, um, yeah, that, that, yeah, that poses a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Um, we also saw um, in these states, so in states like Colorado, uh, we saw increased visits to the emergency room. Um, we had more individuals who were complaining of uh, heart palpitations, uh, complaining of delusions, hallucinations, feeling like they were about to die. Um, and as it turns out, these were individuals who were um, consuming too much or high amounts of uh, cannabis material. Now, this isn't always related to dabbing or ingesting high potency, like in, inhaling high potency THC. Mm -hmm. A lot of times this was connected to eating edibles or like gummy bears that were infused with THC or um, candy bars, chocolates, those sorts of things. And so individuals taking a little bit of chocolate saying, I don't really feel that much of an effect, so I'm just going to eat a little bit more, not realizing that in, at, uh, ingested THC takes a lot longer to get throughout your body than inhaled THC. Um, and unfortunately, the last um, piece that contributed to ER uh, visits was um, was children, so uh, individuals um, under the age of 10, um, talking about maybe infants or, or anyone uh, toddler type of age, so two to five or so. And so getting into seeing that piece of candy, uh, thinking it's just a piece of candy, eating it, and then uh, having a uh, traumatic event. Um, those are the sorts of things that we see in those other states. Wow, yeah, I, I um, with bringing up the edibles, um, I know that's another challenge, like you're saying, that not everybody responds to the same like dose of, of THC. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, having these products that are put out kind of more in the retail environment that might be gummy bears or, you know, a, a cookie or something like that, where, you know, a typical regular serving of gummy bears just no THC infused gummy bears might be like five and you're like, oh yeah, a handful of gummy bears. Like that's what I would mm -hmm. eat. But yeah. in some cases, you know, some of these are so concentrated that it's like a serving is maybe a gummy gummy bear or mm -hmm. even um, a part of a cookie. Yes. Where who eats half a cookie? Everyone eats a whole cookie. <laughs> so, so you're, yeah. you know, that it's probably also contributing that people are just thinking like, oh, a cookie is a serving. Whereas if you look at the packaging, maybe a little bit closer, it may really be intended to be two or three servings, mm -hmm. um, uh, which I could see going, uh, leading down into a, into a, 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 a potentially dangerous situation really quickly. And then yeah. it's also interesting that you bring up the, the, the toddler and youth component too, because I know we've talked about, we've, we've talked to teenagers about vaping, um, vaping products uh, around nicotine, just regular, I guess you could say regular vapes that, you know these crazy flavors that are coming out they they're they're very floral they're very scented they smell you know strawberry vapes smells like strawberry mm -hmm. um and all these things and so the potential for pets to get into it um for younger siblings or maybe if you're out babysitting um and you mm -hmm. have it in your backpack and the kid rifles through your backpack because kids are curious and they come across this thing that smells good or it looks like candy i mean who knows <laughs> it's a gummy yeah. bear right <laughs> um, or a cookie or a chocolate, um, yeah, exactly. that, that potential, that accidental ingestion of, from youth is, um, and from, from younger youth, especially toddlers and kindergartners and stuff like that. Um, it's definitely a recipe for disaster. That'd be not, not great to, to be responsible for, for that ingestion for sure.
No, for sure not. And great point also on the animals is we also yeah. see increase in um, animals that get into your products and they don't know any better. And um, presenting with um, very paranoid kind of darting motions, uh, just a lot of um, like lethargy, um, yeah. thinking, you know, uh, responsible pet owners thinking that uh, their, their pet is, is in serious grave, grave danger. Um, and in some cases they are. Yeah, so, and there's nothing really you can do if somebody is, um, you know, is in the ER, you know, a, a, you know, sick enough or in distress enough to go to the ER or take your vet to the, the your, your, your pet to the vet. There's, it's not like there's, we have Narcan for, um, for opioid overdose, you know, we can mm -hmm. pump your stomach if you, if you're over, if you're overdosing or having um, alcohol poisoning and stuff like that. But is there really anything we can do if somebody's in distress from marijuana ingestion? Not really. Um, really, you just have to have them in a calm environment. Um, you'll also want to make sure that um, that any potential life-threatening toxicities are taken care of. Now, compared to an opioid like a heroin or a fentanyl, the um, the overdose of a cannabis product is unlikely to cause a life-threatening event. So I don't. I'm not aware of incidences where an individual only ingested marijuana and uh, and died from that. Um, okay. However, you also want to be con be careful or be concerned about the fact that, uh, just like we were saying with the vape pens, if you don't know exactly what is in your product, you're not aware if you are ingesting a material that also has something else with it, maybe a pesticide or a heavy metal. So we've seen heavy metal toxicities in uh, in some of these uh, some of these products, and that can cause either short and long term uh, types of effects to patients. But in terms of something that reverses the effects of a cannabis overdose, we don't have anything for that. So uh, if you are in a bad way and you get taken to the emergency room, uh, we're going to make sure that your body temperature is okay. So cannabis can uh, cool the cool the body, make you uh, feel really hypothermic. Um, we can also give you some medications to kind of calm you down, calm down your heart, uh, but we can't give you anything that's going to calm down your anxiety or calm down your paranoia, uh, calm down the racing thoughts that uh, some individuals have, the delusions, the hallucinations. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very, uh, it can be a very bad experience, and depending on how much you're ingesting, it can be a very long experience. But it also brings up another good point in terms of other adverse consequences of cannabis use, particularly long term, is um, is uh, cannabis associated nausea and vomiting. Um, in that um, individuals, even though that uh, people say that they um, that they can smoke marijuana to stop to stop their uh, their nausea uh, or um, uh, stop yeah stop their nausea and vomiting. Uh, high enough concentrations can paradoxically cause more nausea and vomiting. So a hyperemesis syndrome, cyclic vomiting syndrome, these are all also things that are kind of gross that uh, could also be associated with um, extensive use of cannabis for a long time. Gotcha. That's really good to know because I know, I mean, we haven't really, we're not going to really dive into the medicinal side of marijuana use, but yeah, that's what people tend to turn to about um, about the you know, potential benefits of marijuana being that, you know, helping with um, uh, nausea and stuff like that. And to know that, you know, too much can actually reverse that and cause you to have more nausea and vomiting. Like, mm -hmm. don't want that. that it's not, not, not pleasant to go through. No, super gross. Um, so jumping back to legalization. So we've kind of talked about these, these lessons from other states. Um, I just saw a headline about Madison. Can you Tell us about what's happening kind of locally in Wisconsin. Yeah, absolutely. So here in Wisconsin, um, state law is going to be actually pretty, uh, um, like kind of harsh in terms of uh, very strong, I guess I would say, compared to the other states. So Illinois, for example, decriminalize anyone can use it. Rec everyone over a certain age can use it recreationally or medicinally. Minnesota says that only a person who has a prescription from a licensed uh, physician and medication that's been dispensed by a licensed pharmacist 
Only those individuals may possess uh, marijuana for medicinal use only. Wisconsin is very different in that we regulate and we control um, both cannabis and marijuana plants that have THC and then also hemp plants. These are going to be cannabis plants that don't have a lot of THC. Um, we control them all the same way. And so if you are caught in the state with, um, with a amount of marijuana, uh, as a first offense, they could charge you with a misdemeanor, give you a fine, potentially jail time. Every subsequent offense could then be a felony. And now you're talking about longer, uh, bigger fines and longer term incarceration. So cannabis here in the state of Wisconsin is um, very different to other states. So that's something to be concerned about. Now, in terms of Madison specifically, so, um, so cannabis in the United States is a controlled substance that says that if a federal officer, such as a member of the Drug Enforcement Administration or the DEA, if they find you, they can charge you with a federal offense. The state of Wisconsin has its own laws governing cannabis. I was just talking about those. But then other cities can actually make their own laws. And so they can essentially tell their law enforcement officers what to do when they come across marijuana. And so what Madison did, what the city of Madison did uh, just a couple months ago, is they passed a resolution that said we are going to decriminalize uh, the possession of and use of a small amount of marijuana. And so that just basically means that when their cops are on the street um, and a person has less than, I think it's 28 grams of cannabis on them, on them at the time, they just say, you know what, just go home, go away, but they can't arrest them. They're not going to arrest them for that. Um, sure. Now, if you're going to smoke, you could smoke that in, uh, in public places, uh, private places. They, would, they could give you a fine and you could, uh, you could have to go to court. So you'd have to pay some court fees, um, but you still cannot smoke um, near any place that bans cigarette smoking and that sort of thing. Now, gotcha. it's important to say, it's important to remember that this is not a city saying marijuana is now safe. And it's now okay. This is a city saying, we're just not going to focus on this. Our men and women are going to focus on other stuff. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that just because it's legal, it's now super safe and everyone can go and use as much as they want. It's still a dangerous and controlled substance. Yeah. That's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, like I think a really good comparison in some ways is alcohol, that alcohol is legal for for use for people that are at least 21 years old um and obviously you can't drink and drive and there's laws and 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 stuff around how and where and where you know how when and where you can you can consume alcohol but it's certainly not i don't think anybody would 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 agree that it's necessarily like a safe substance right, right. um especially when used um in excess and mm -hmm. so yes we said that alcohol is legal but there are tons of health, um, negative health outcomes associated with alcohol. Um, and I think, you know, we, we're all familiar with the short-term outcomes of, of excessive alcohol use being intoxicated, um, you know, and, and mm -hmm. all those concerns that go along with it. But yes, it is, it is legal. It yep. is not safe though. Um, and, exactly. and so the same, I think, is a really important message to drive home about marijuana, even in these states that are legalizing it for medicinal or retail use. Um, it does not mean it's safe. Um, and, you know, we certainly need, there's a lot of research yet to be done to really like, like tease out exactly, um, exactly what those long-term health, out, health outcomes look like, but then also that it's being used in these very novel ways in edibles and concentrates um, and in, you know, put into oils to be used in vape cartridges and e-cigarettes that we also don't necessarily know how safe they are. You mentioned the heavy metals, you know, um, mm -hmm. the heavy metal and tox um, toxicity um, coming from the heating coil and those elements used to physically make those e-cigarette devices. Um, you're right, we have seen a, some, some research come out around that and the fact that, you know, they are such a new product that we don't necessarily have all the details on the impacts of those physical products themselves, 
Um, and so there's just a lot of reason to be very, very cautious um, yes. around marijuana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because, um, just because you don't, I, I guess what you could say is kind of coming back to the opioid side of things and like mm -hmm. the heroin and fentanyl, just because a drug is not like heroin and fentanyl levels of dangerous doesn't mean it's like water levels of safe. There's yeah. a lot of in between and there's a lot of how much you're exposed to, what are you exposed to, when are you exposing yourself to it, that all comes into place. And so it's really probably the better option to stay away from stuff, um, you know, if, if you can. Um, I actually just, I was, I was thinking about something you said earlier as well about, um, about reaction times and people uh, who might be um, like behind the wheel, but then you also mentioned athletes. And I wanted to come back to that because uh, I have had uh, colleagues who are uh, high school coaches or football, wrestling, you know, some of these high impact sports who have come to me and said, hey, listen, I've got wrestlers or I've got football players who are, you know, they've got the aches and pains, you know, they're playing softball every day, they're getting beat up and they want to they hear that using CBD is going to be good for them. Uh, what do you have mm -hmm. to say about that? And I think the big or a big key uh, issue here too, in addition to all the stuff I was telling you about before, long-term consequences, IQ diminishing, et cetera. Another key issue is with not knowing what's in your product is if your product has a little bit of THC and you are an athlete and you submit yourself to a urine sample, if you don't know what's in your product, you got THC in there, all of a sudden you are now off the team. And yeah. so there is all kinds of reasons, um, not only from health reasons, social reasons, but then also athletic reasons to be really, really careful and really stay away from a lot of these products that you don't know what they are. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, for athletes, for anybody who, you know, a ton of occupations that have to submit um, uh, urine samples for upon hiring or randomly throughout their employment, um, that's a really good point that it could be, it could impact that negatively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, this is awesome. So we've kind of covered the questions that have been submitted so far. Um, is there, are, do you have any other kind of closing thoughts or anything that we didn't touch on that you think is really important for our community to know? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think one of the things that's the most important in this day and age is the idea of finding facts and of finding reputable facts true facts and listening to science and listening to experts. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There are a lot of resources that you kind of wonder, is this legit? Is it not? A lot of people are saying this, but does that make it true? Um, and so I think what I would maybe leave people with is, is some places to go to actually find these facts. And um, I'm really going to go and stay right with the federal government. They, uh, our tax dollars uh, go to support um, research and go to support um, like federal legislations in helping individuals and giving you the information that you need. So um, I think probably the number one place that I would go and is a great resource for the, the lay public is uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, also known as NIDA, N-I-D-A. NIDA is the Institute of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, really close where I grew up, um, that is dedicated to understanding and controlling and stopping and reversing substance abuse and dependence in all its forms. And so NIDA is the resource for not only facts about marijuana, so everything I said here today, I made sure that is, is true to form with what NIDA is, uh, talks about. Um, you know, they got information on marijuana, alcohol, cigarettes, you name it. Anything that is a substance of abuse, if you're interested or curious to know what is the scope of the problem um, and that sort of thing, that's the number one place to go. Um, another place to go is the CDC, the Centers for uh, Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, just uh, cdc.gov. Um, so the CDC, they don't just do infectious disease stuff, 
I mean, we've seen them do a lot of that recently, but they also have information that's available for you uh, to know about um, how, uh, how disease uh, can be affected by uh, drugs like cannabis. Um, and then I guess the last place um, that I would suggest is the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. So the U.S. Food and Drug Administration um, is the, uh, the regulatory agency whose job it is to, um, to review uh, any product that says it's going to do something medicinal. So uh, if you see a product on the shelf at your pharmacy that says this will lower your cholesterol by a certain percent, that is something that you know that the FDA has put their stamp of approval on. Many of these cannabis products uh, have not, in fact, been uh, looked at by the FDA. And the Food and Drug Administration is very concerned about individuals not getting the proper information about safety of some of these products. So NIDA, I guess I should call the, uh, the webpage for NIDA Drug Facts. Uh, if you just do a Google search for NIDA Drug Facts, marijuana, they'll all come up. Um, but NIDA, uh, CDC, and FDA, excellent opportunities for more information. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I, I definitely would would second your recommendations. Um, I know I've used NIDA for really great resources to share with parents and with teens, because I know that I have a whole teens area as well for um, for information for, for uh, adolescents. And then CDC is actually the grant managing um, entity behind one of our larger grants that funds our coalition, the Drug Free Communities Grant. Um, actually mm -hmm. just switched over to CDC um, oversight. So I know everyone, it's all in the news for COVID and everything like that, but substance substance abuse prevention is obviously another key, um, mm -hmm. a, a, a key goal and area for, for public health and FDA. I really appreciate you kind of like teasing out that whole like medicinal piece of it that, you know, if you look at FDA, you know, on medication supplements, anything basically claiming to fix or solve or help with any type of health condition, FDA is gonna have something to say about it. So yep. great, great, um, great to point towards pe people towards there. And I will, um, I'll go ahead and find some of those links, the direct links to marijuana, um, mm -hmm. anything cannabis, CBD or THC related and, and put those in the comments below so people can go right to those spots. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing those, those are awesome. Um, and thank you everyone for watching and anybody who might be viewing later, we appreciate that. Um, and if you want to learn anything more um, about what Community Alliance is doing, obviously our Facebook page is going to be a great place to do that. Go ahead and scroll through there or our website, which I've linked in the comments below. And Dr. Cunningham's, um, he has a blog, so his, that blog link is in, the, is in the comments below as well. Go ahead and check it out. Um, and thank you, Dr. Cunningham, for your time today. I really appreciate it. We're so lucky to have so many great experts um, right here in our area and uh, being able to partner with Concordia to, to, to bring this to our community. We, we really appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. The pleasure is all mine. And uh, part of our mission is uh, service to our communities. And so uh, we, love to see, um, we love to see interactions uh, between us and high school, college, and, and beyond. So super, super pr proud to be a part of this. Oh, thank you. All right. Excellent. Well, have a great rest of your afternoon.